Greetings all and welcome back to our tour of the Super Corsair at the HGM in Vienna, Austria. Uh, by the way, the place is only open on weekends right now, so uh, make sure you check the schedule before you show up on a Tuesday. It's not going to work well for you. Right, so I am in the commander's hatch and I am converting, so I've used a bit of Patreon money and bought myself a new GoPro. Because my camera ain't going to fit in here. I may not fit in here, but it is cozy, very cozy. But no matter, onwards we go with the commander's cupola and primary sight. It's got a one, two, three, four, five, six optics scattered around them. But now I shall grab the GoPro and go inside. Right, so the interior of the Corsair Commander's position. Now, I may have mentioned it was a bit cozy, and cozy it is. It's not too bad ordinarily, except for one small little matter, is that there were five rounds of 105 millimeter stowage at my feet, which are kind of getting into it now. I do have, a, granted, I have a large audio recorder in my rear pocket getting in my way, but... Uh, Actually, I see three there. There must be two somewhere else in here. At least in this particular vehicle. Apparently in the regular Corsair, it's five. Anyway, uh, as I am going around, and I've already got my jeans killed with uh, FRH, starting off to the front is the Commander's Periscope. It's got a... It's been out of focus. Let me fix the focus here. Very clear optics. I mean, for, for a museum piece, they've, they've done well keeping this here. Uh, oh, that's why it's on the wrong. Okay. Uh, it has a range scale, it has uh, mills, uh, crosshair. Let's see if I can get a, an inset shot of it. Uh, but as you can see, this optic is fixed in train. So he can, I guess, in theory, use it as a backup sight. It has a crosshair. I don't see. Uh, is this for the range, perhaps? No, what's this? Let's see what happens. Oh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, pupil distance, interpupillary distance control. So this must be, aha, here is your range finder. So this little toggle here will adjust the reticle up and down according to the graduations on the two sides. So, yep. What we have then is we have a fixed backup sight and a, uh, a no cupola traverse on this. So this is literally fixed to the vehicle. Otherwise, as you ran, so I do have, as I say, the, oh, there's a seventh periscope directly behind me here. Uh, the hatch control is kind of inconvenient. Uh, J-Box looks like four positions. The, uh, the dome light is your standard American style dome light. Again, the Austrians were very heavily influenced by the Americans. Uh, behind me, you can see one of the drums for the carousel. On the right hand side, gunner's controls. So I am looking at, well, firstly, up here is the rammer handle. Uh, so the breech is located right here. So I'm, my hand is just touching the breech block now. Uh, so you would open with this, uh, let's see, turret motors to my knees as I scan around to the right, shove the camera a little bit further back here. You can see the loading mechanism, so it is a revolver, you can see that the revolver uh, slots for or holders, for, shall we say, aren't U-shaped uh, directly, they are ramped or straightened so that it forms a little ramp and the round will fall out of the ramp and then hop, drop into the loading tray. If you have to, you reach back over your right shoulder and you give it a little shove uh, just to finish loading on the loading tray, after which point it gets rammed forwards. As I look down to the right, well, let's see what we can see here, is a couple of control panels, one for the major uh, turret uh, components. Uh, so we got turret power, uh, turret on, stab on, turret power off. 
Uh, up above, this looks like you can control for the autoloader uh, system, the revolvers. So depending on which one you're loading, you left or right, and then you push the button and it will rotate one cycle. It's loaded, as you saw, from the top. And I think these are just simply power controls. You recall that the original 105 revolvers were hand cranked and uh, there was a little clip of that, I'll insert it now. And what they've done here is they have motorized it, you see from the control, but they have retained the option of a manual control. So if you look right down at the bottom there, let's see if I've got it in the frame, you're going to see a small little hex head. There it is. And you can attach a handle onto that and crank away. Other things in the commander's compartment, well, he has the rangefinder control to his front. Now, what's interesting about this is that he has a minimum range gate. So, uh, depending on if he's worried about getting a bad laze due to bushes or some other form of obstacle in the way, uh, he simply rotates this to show how close the nearest obstacle is that he doesn't want to return less than. Uh, so let's say 400 meters, any returns less than 400 meters are going to be rejected. Handy enough. Uh, down below to his control panel, well, he's got his uh, power system here. Now the elevation on this is now electric. Uh, it used to be hydraulic, they changed it in the mid 80s. The autoloader primary control, so right carousel or left carousel revolver, probably a better term. The fire control components were taken off of what is in effect an early Leopard 2. Uh, so although it has options here for four types of ammunition, in actuality, of course, you'd only really be carrying two at a time, as I had mentioned previously. So you control for the machine gun or different types of ammunition in the ballistic computer. The control handles are a little bit different from those of uh, the gun because they don't have a laser range finder control. So you have main gun, coaxial gun, lead application. So remember, the, the Germans have a slightly different control system for applying lead, dynamic lead, and of course the PAM controllers to actually activate the entire system. If you look a bit further down, you're going to see the radio is located way down by my feet. Actually, let me see if I can get a better shot up here. So you need to look down uh, to see the radios and the camera is currently located more or less where my head would be. So if you go all the way down, I have to kind of be careful with the lamps here, but I have to reach all the way down and this is where my good long arms come in handy to reach any of the various controls. It's basically the only place they could find to stick this additional radio. Oh, I forgot to mention at the very bottom of the control panel down here is the ballistic computer itself. So you can insert your correction factors. You can uh, put inputs for crosswind, or if you have to do a manual range, you can do a manual range input here as well. I will also observe that on my feet are storage bins for three boxes of coax ammunition. Now the coax ready bin is directly underneath the main gun. So it seems to me that somehow, and I have absolutely no idea how you would actually do it, you're supposed to grab one of these spare boxes from your feet and then feed it into the loading tray on the right and then it gets fed into the gun from there by the gunner. No idea how it's done. Ah. So after a couple of tries, I'm beginning to wonder if all I have to do is just hook some lanyards or something, strap those to the inside of the turret, and then all I have to do is get my leg out of the way, yank up. Uh, either that, you have to be very small. Now you may not be able to tell, but I have now moved to the gunner seat. And yeah, there's a couple of problems with this. Uh, I forgot to mention that the seats do have a lifting uh, seat bed so that you can stand on the turret floor and it just folds down simply enough as, as a lot of American ones will do. So that's not the problem. The problem I have is that it's uh, kind of cozy and things move. And you're going to see this is particularly a problem for your legs. 
So the problem with this being a oscillating turret is that, well, things move. Now, ordinarily, this can be worked around, but it seems that for whatever reason, they didn't work around this one. So the entire top turret, of course, is fixed to the gun. So as the gun goes up, well, the sights go up because they're fixed to the turret roof. The control handles go up because they're basically fixed to the sight, which is fixed to the turret roof. The seat upon which I am sitting goes up because it's hanging from the turret roof. Similarly, when the gun goes down, the sights go down, the handles go down, the seats go down. My feet don't go down because my feet are sitting on pedals and the pedals are attached to the floor. You may be able to see where this is going. So here are my legs and they're on, they're on the pedals. So these are the manual backup pedals. There are the electrical triggers on the front here, but these are the, uh, the manual physical back, backup pedals. And you can see I am basically bouncing off the control. I don't have very much room here. Now, as the turret gun depresses to its maximum depression of six degrees, that means that this entire module is coming down and compressing on my knees. And I guess in theory, my bones will then shatter. Uh, the maximum elevation, by the way, is 13. Uh, so this was a problem with the system that was probably not entirely fixed. On a manual system, it would be pretty reasonable to be able to assume that you could anticipate movement of the turret. So, oh, I'm about to depress the gun, I will better get my leg out of the way. Or, I'm depressing the gun, ow, I better stop. With a stabilized system, that doesn't happen because the computer is depressing the gun. And if your the leg is in the way, you're going to have a crushed leg. So, now perhaps really, really small tankers didn't have this problem. This is entirely possible. I'm not a really, really small tanker. Anyway, the rest of the system, although as I say, it's cozy, so I'm literally my right, my right shoulder is currently bashed up against the uh, laser control module and my left shoulder is right pressed up against the gun shield. I get a little bit more room if I move forward to the sights. I can move about two inches one side or the other and then I stick my head to the sights. But uh, in terms of the actual controls, it's, it's res relatively easily laid out. So. Uh, let's see, to my front, I have the daylight optic and the night optic. And the night, obviously, I can't do anything with because it's a passive imager and uh, I, it requires power to look through. However, I can look through the daylight. And as I stick the camera in, you should be able to see, there it is, the reticle. And this is a combination, of, there we go. This is a combination of the reticle of the Curacier standard with the auxiliary rain reticle of the Leopard 2 with the stadiometric on the right. And on top of it would be projected the reticle of the Leopard 2's fire control system. Uh, now again, it has to be projected, it's a light. So we're not gonna see it here. Uh, but what we're gonna have is basically two different reticles, one on top of the other. The suspicion is that if this vehicle ever entered service, they would put an entirely new site in and you wouldn't have one reticle superimposed on top of the other. But it's entirely possible that may not be the case because there is no alternate backup site on this vehicle. So if the projector system went down and you're down to basically manual unpowered gunnery, then that reticle is all that will be left, uh, unless you count the commander's side maybe. Uh, so. The question then becomes, is it worth getting rid of this backup reticle? Can you gun with the two in the one site? And the answer is probably yes, you can. But uh, either way, it, uh, it didn't see service, so we don't know for sure. The revolver over my shoulder is the same as the one on the commander's side. It's reversed. And that leads to another problem that they have with the stabilizer. Because uh, you can imagine that because you're stabilizing an entire top turret, the thing is a little bit heavy and needs to be well balanced. But you keep firing rounds out of the extreme far end of the bustle. And it's the old force multiplied by distance thing. So the weight of the 12 rounds of ammunition as you use them up, start unbalancing the turret, which is a problem for the analog stabilizer. So 
the more you've shot, the less stable your stabilizer was stabilizing. To my front left is the machine gun. It's the mounting for the MG74. It's the Austrian version of the MG42. They, they must have liked it. It is a 7.62 NATO type machine gun. After firing, the spent shell casing and link both go down into a chute where there will be a spent casing bag. Okay, so as I tour around the front, there is a brow pad for the main sight. The same control panel is found for the gunner, as was on the commander side, as is the autoloader selector. The control handle is very similar, except for the one addition they have is a rocker for the laser rangefinder. Now, the same module controller is over the right shoulder, uh, but this is your laser rangefinder control, and again, to apply dynamic lead. Controls, well, they rotate in the western manner and elevate as you would expect. Manual controls, I thought about it, they're out of the way. They, they fold out of the way, and then you can crank. And actually, moving the turret doesn't take all that much effort. Although you can see, as it starts to get closer to my knees, and the Travis control is located here. Yeah, it's a little heavy. The problem is a very small controller, but it looks like it'll work. And that is basically it for the turret of this Super Curacier. It's relatively simple, all things considered, but by God, it's cramped. Okay, time to get out and let's see what we can do about driving. Now, one of the questions I had when I was initially told this thing carries 43 rounds of ammunition was where the hell do you fit it all? Because the 105 isn't exactly a small round. Well, they cheated. They used a small 105 round. So remember, the M57 is a well, sort of a medium pressure gun, I guess closer to low pressure by modern standards. But back in the day, not high velocity, not low velocity. So what I have here are three rounds. On the right hand side, uh, I have on your left, obviously, a standard NATO type 105 millimeter round as fired from an M60, as fired from, you know, whatever. Sabre round. And look how much thicker it is than the French ammunition. So you got about 30% more power coming out of this NATO round than you do from this Sabre round or this heat round. Now it's a rifle barrel heat round. It is a counter rotating system inside the shell to stop the heat charge from spinning too much because of course heat rounds don't like being spun. But uh, you can see, especially with the base of it, how you can get a lot more of these smaller rounds into a vehicle than these longer ones, wider ones even. They're, they're, I mean, they're, yeah, there are longer 105 rounds as well, but wider. Okay, so there's only one more place to go and that is the driver's hole. However, I'm gonna make you wait because there is a further stage in the development program of the Curacier, which I didn't even know existed until France told me about it. So do you want to go check it out? Hmm, okay. So what we're going to do, because the driver's compartment is basically the same between the two vehicles, is we're going to take a break here. I'm going to make you wait a little bit, and I'll be back in a week or two with part three of a Super Curacier. So until then, thanks for watching, and I will talk to you on the next one. There's France. Uh, he's, he's checking up uh, for me on some of the specifications that I'm asking him off camera. So, again, I'm sorry I couldn't wire him up, just audio issues I'm having. So it's minus 6 to plus 13. That's not actually very much. Okay. And the standard curve series is the same? Same. Hmm. All right. That was easy. <laughs> now we get to put them back.